Okay. Um, my name is uh, Will Fellows. Uh, I'm one of the two members of the uh, Astrologers of the Village. My wife, Wendy Barter, and I uh, have uh, do these, cat, these uh, Zoom meetings, and we record them for those that would like to uh, read them and, uh, and learn from them. This particular talk, like I said, my, I've been, I'm a second generation astrologer. My mother was an astrologer and uh, I learned from her at a very early age. I was very good at calculating uh, the charts before they had computers. And so uh, that's a little history. And, and we have some other, we do have a, a YouTube site called the Village Astrologers. And this is another talk that will be posted on that site. And it's a, it's a presentation that I've been working on and been wanting to do for a long time, the fixed stars. In astrology, we mostly look at the planets and the luminaries, the sun and the moon. But also there's the, uh, there is at least, we'll say the top 25 fixed stars. There are stars that the ancients noticed that were very bright in the sky, but they didn't wander or move like the planets. And so they, they recognized that there was the wanderers or the planets, but there were all these points called the fixed stars. Um, let's see. Uh, where's the, uh, okay, I've got it down here, I think. Okay, I'm gonna go into a little history of the fixed stars. And of course the uh, ancients were always looking to the skies. Uh, they, it was one thing that, you know, regardless of the civilizations, we would always go out at night in, in wonderment view the, uh, the fixed stars and the, the planets and the sun and the moon. So, but like most astrologers actually emphasize the sun, moon and planets in their chart. And there's various techniques from the natal interpretations, mundane astrology, natal astrology, there's financial astrology in various forms. And they mostly use the sun, moon and planets, but the fixed stars can also give very uh, significant information about the, we'll say the directions and paths that may be taking place in the natal chart in the horoscope. The, of course, the horoscope astrologers will cast a horoscope, which is comprised of 12 houses. Each house has a representation. Uh, first house is the personality and the person in a natal chart. In a mundane chart, it's the people and We'll say the uh, people of a country and so forth. Later on in this presentation, I will have uh, four examples where I will go through the horoscope chart and I will show, uh, I'll give a general reading and then I will show how the fixed stars actually illuminated the chart. Um, so as it says here, the stars are usually referred to as fixed stars by astrologers. And when we look up, we see them uh, the, they look like planets, but planets move through the sky. And of course, there's there also the stars are, I will say, they're part of usually constellations. And the constellations, such as Orion, the Big Dipper, they do not change shape over time. A fixed star will move only one degree of longitude, or that's the movement through the zodiac, every 72 years. So they're really, they're in a sign for a very long time. They're in each sign 2,160 years, because if you take the procession of the equinox, the stars move because of the procession of the equinox, and that's the due to the incline of the earth to 23 and a half degrees, and then they'll, they'll, it moves very slowly, this procession, this, this wobble of the earth that actually defines the ages. And I'll go up a little bit further into that. So fixed stars in ancient times, each star had a specific influence. And of course, it goes back to the Egyptians. I have a little history there. And, and the Greeks uh, were significant in basically determining how the stars, the fixed star, influence us. Some stars, for example, can have a destabilizing energy. They both have positive and negative. So what the ancients started doing, especially Ptolemy, the uh, great Greek philosopher and scientist, we, he basically started to notice they had influences like the planets. And of course, in the astrology at that time, they had five planets and the sun and the moon, which were the, sort of the seven rays, the seven, the seven rays of influence. So he started noticing certain stars would have the influence of a Mars, Mars, Mercury, or a Mars, Jupiter. 
and they would they would and they would ex, they would affect the people on that chart the, similar to the natures of the planets. And this last quote was a quote from David Cochran. He is an astrologer that we know in Gainesville. Uh, he he is a one of the architects of by he is the architect of vibrational astrology, and also he wrote uh, the astrology program Sirius and also Kepler. Now the history of the fixed stars go, goes back to Hipparchus, who devised the first known catalog. They started cataloging all these fixed stars, and he started he went out and projected 850 stars onto the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is the path of the path the earth follows around the sun. And of course, and I'll go in later I, that the ecliptic, stars close to the ecliptic are given a lot, of, a great prominence. But uh, Ptolemy, who was also a famed astrologer during the Greek times, astronomer and mathematician from Alexandria. And of course, Alexandria was a uh, Greek city in Egypt, the, uh, uh, right on the Nile Delta. And he, he expanded this work, his earlier work. So. They, they, the Greeks are very good at developing a, pers you know, a progression of knowledge. So at the end of 149 AD, Ptolemy had listed 1,022 stars by longitude, which gives you the, uh, the, um, the position in the astrological sign, and latitude, which tells you how close it is to the ecliptic. Uh, this time, Ptolemy, he took the procession into account so this star list could be used for future generations. By power of observation, he was able to determine that the star was moving almost a degree every 72 years. Now, Ptolemy used this Ptolemaic uh, model to relate to nature of the fixed stars and the planetary equivalents in order to understand the star's influence, meanings, and powers. Now, this is one of the enigmas of fixed stars that takes a little while, it took me a while to ponder it and to reflect upon it because um, it's not always evident how you can translate the influence of a fixed star into your natal chart or into a chart of a nation. And, and, it, and I hope to illuminate that because it wasn't always clear. You have all these books. The book I like is Fixed Stars and Constellations by Vivian Rob, Robs, Robson. And that was also my mother's book. So I had my mother's book. And I always thought that she had a very um, clear uh, interpretation of the stars. But again, there's so many of them. So what I'd like to do here is I have my top 20. I'm gonna, and uh, so I will be going through, I'm, I'm streamlining it down to, I think, which are the most important. And uh, the 20 or 25, you can go into a book and go more. But Okay, so the key thing is, you know, we have all these stars in the heavens and they're part of constellations. And how do we use them as astrological purposes? So. Uh, Ptolemy and others, they looked at the longitude method on the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the path the sun takes to travel around the earth and is comprised of 360 degrees of the zodiac. And since the 30s, the fixed astrologers uh, all use the longitude method for their interpretation. What that means, where was it positioned in the zodiac sign? But the, the, uh, So this is the list of how we look at the significance or the power of the star. So the brighter the star, uh, you know, the more powerful. Sirius at minus 1.3, and this, this, this scale, and they call it magnitude one stars, are, they, they start off at minus 1.43 to six. So stars that have a negative number or, or one something are the most powerful. The ones that are five and six, they're, not, they, they're, they're considered not as bright or as strong. So the first order magnitudes are the most powerful. And we'll be going through that. My top 20 are almost all first order magnitude stars. Now, the longitude is also considered the position in the zodiac sign because there's 360 degrees. Each zodiac sign has just like um, uh, dividing a circle into 12 zodiac signs. You have 30 degrees in the sign. So you know, we break it out from Aries to Pisces, the 12 zodiac signs. The fixed stars will have a position in there. Now they do change over time. We've had some stars, fixed stars change, and I'll go a little bit into that too. The latitude is, uh, the ancients especially considered those that were close to ecliptic, close to the path that the, uh, that the earth followed around the sun, very strong and significant. And the declination is north or south, but that tells you how close it is 
to the equator and also gives you a relative understanding where it is to the ecliptic. The fixed star's effect of the chart is determined by the conjunction is the most powerful and the most powerful, of course, to luminaries and planets ascended in midheaven. So we usually, I also use the, the uh, nodes and sometimes we'll lo I'll look at a aspect if it's very tight or a midpoint, but the main things are the conjunctions. And what that means is when the fixed star is casting a spotlight on a particular planet or point in the, um, in the uh, natal chart or zodiac, uh, and it basically is like a spot, like a laser light shining on a planet or position in this, the chart. I look at the planets like they're like uh, field radiators. They're very close to the earth and they're like an electromagnetic radiator, gravitational radiator and all the fields interact. So all the aspects that we have in a, in a that we look at in the planets and with the, uh, the luminaries and planets become very significant because it's a little different uh, has a different uh, energy. So what we're seeing from the fixed stars are photons, the light energy coming many light years away. It's Sirius, I think, is something like five light years or six light years. But they're still, we're still seeing those photons, the light, the, bu the bundles of energy that comprise light. And when they hit here, they're still carrying that vibratory energy of that particular star and, it's, and it shines a spotlight in, the, in the, that planet. The orb, they use very small orbs, orbs for those, um, um, and for you know, astrologically is the closer it is to a point in the zodiac, be it a planet, a luminary, a node, send it or midheaven, uh, the more powerful it is. And we usually like to use 1.5 degrees or less. And I, I, it's one degrees or less for most stars, but there's a few significant stars like the royal stars and the most bright stars, the most powerful stars, you can do one and a half stars. Now, it says, and also in this formula, you look at the meaning of the fixed star and using Ptolemy's system. And there's also others that have followed Ptolemy and preceded him that used a different planetary configuration, but I like Ptolemy's planetary configuration. And also the zodiac sign it's in, presently in. Now, most of the stars were defined when they were in uh, another constellation, but through time they moved in. My theory is, is that they, they have, it's like taking a lens of the sign. The light coming from those fixed stars goes through a lens and the, it's still, this, it's a vibration, but it's being, it's being shifted relative to the energy of the zodiac sign that it's in. And also the element of the star. Here again, the fire, water, earth, uh, air elements of the uh, of the zodiac, and we'll go. I'll, I'll we'll talk more about that. It's it's hard to not without pictures, so we'll we'll go further. So, but the first that we really want to look at that always the 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 medieval astrologers, and especially a lot of the astrologers in the early 20th century and 19th century, always placed on the outer edge of the of the chart the four royal stars, or I mean, they didn't always, but they placed, a lot of the astrologers would place these royal stars. Um, and so the four royal stars are Gamalhalt, Regulus, which was in Leo, is now in Virgo, Aldebaran, and Antares. Antares was in Scorpio, now it's in Sagittarius. Aldebaran uh, was in, um, I, it was in Aquarius, and now it's in Pisces. And Fomaltahawk was in Taurus and is now in Gemini. But the reason why, due to the procession of the equinox, uh, these were very significant because the, these were rising at the time of the seasonal, uh, the seasons. And we'll see. And so they were very significant because they would mark the beginning of seasons, be they summer, or spring, winter, or fall. So in astrology, the Persians in particular. Uh, regarded these uh, great royal stars as guardians in the sky. And it was around approximately 3000 uh, uh, BCE before the common era during the time of the ancient Persians in the area of the modern day Iran that they started really taking note of this. And they, of course, divided the sky. They considered that these royal stars divided the four districts with each district being guarded by one of the royal stars, sort of like 
um, archangels. They would be, there's also angels associated with many of the stars. The stars were believed to hold both good and evil, but I say positive and negative. It's a blending of the planetary energies and the Persians look for them for guidance and you know, their scientific calculations of the sky because they're markers in the sky. So they could use them for calendars and lower lunar solar cycles and for predictions of the future. And um, now the ancient Egyptians also mentioned they had a zodiac of their own in the, uh, in the Egyptian astrologers and astronomers were very aware of not only the royal stars, of course, the planets, and you will find in many of the um, uh, the ancient, you know, the ancient, um, I will say, on the walls within the temples in Egypt. And I'm trying to remember the one. Uh, there's one that in particular which has uh, the Egyptian zodiac on the on on the one of the walls within the temples. Um, now the Persian prophet uh, Zarathustra, sometimes it's a pun kind. Zarathustra mentioned them in the. Uh, but the his uh, Buddha Hisna, uh, there was a collection, and there was also a collection of Zoroastrian cosmology. I'm having trouble here tonight. It's been a long day. I think it's yeah, Zoroastrian. And that was approximately 1500 BC. Um, now, the constellations or the world stars were said to be fixed because their positions were close to the four fixed points of the sun's path. And of course, at this time, uh, we were in, when they did this, we were in the age of uh, Taurus. And of course, then we had the age of Aries and every 2100, every uh, 2100, uh, 2160 years, we have a shift. The sun was surrounded by uh, four bright stars at the beginning of every season. So from this, they, they began to note these as the royal stars. And of course, there was uh, Eldebaran, and in the parentheses are the Persian names, and that would herald the vernal equinox. And at this time, Aldebaran was in uh, Taurus and was the watcher of the east. And Regulus was the summer solstice, and it was in uh, it was in uh, Leo, and it was watcher of the north. And Taurus, the autumn equinox, and at that time it would be in Scorpio, was forming a grand cross in the fixed signs and. But Mulhalt was in the winter solstice sign, and that was um, and that was the watcher of the south. Go to the next one. <clears throat> so I said they were the four. They were royal because they were the dominant stars that you could see in the sky, and they and they were the brightest stars amongst the twenty five brightest stars in the night sky, and they they considered them to be guardians, the watchers and guardians of the, of the seasons and the sectors of the skies. Aldebaran watched the Eastern sky was dominant star in the constellation Taurus, and it marked the uh, vernal equinox. Regulus, as I said, was in the dominant star, and the dominant star is called the alpha star of the, of the constellation that it's in. So Regulus marked the summer solstice, and it was seen as a main star because it was in Leo, giving the power of the lion, signifying the strength of kings with large implications. We have a couple charts where Regulus is prominent in their charts, and we'll see uh, how, this, how this royal star brought about a significant life. And that's one thing I've noticed too. Uh, very, fam very famous leaders and people that are very much in the public eyes will have a well, a lot of a lot of times have a a royal star at an important and critical point in their chart. Antares was the watcher of the west, that is the alpha star in Scorpio, and had marked the autumn equinox. There there was two stars that that would uh, will say that the ancients many times would become very wary when they would appear. Antares was one of them because Antares was almost the um, it was Mar very Mars-like, and it was a foreteller of war. And the other star that they also used to uh, watch for, and we'll be talking about it, Sirius, which is the brightest star in the zodiac. That, and of course, the dog days of summer were marked by Sirius appearing in the sky, very markedly strong at the uh, uh, at, in the sky. So that was also another augur uh, to proceed with caution. And Fomalthaut uh, watched the uh, southern sky and was the brightest star in the constellation Pisces. 
and it marked the uh, winter solstice. Now, as I said, these are the positions of the four royal stars at present and today. And uh, as, I, as I said, then the many of the astrologers from medieval time and ancient times, they would mark these points in the chart. Then these were the four that they would use. And, and of course, I look at, since I've done this talk, I look at 20 stars. And I find they, and the 25 would be probably a good list too. That and many times they point uh, the destiny, quote, they show where you are going to be, what you're going to be pursuing. And I have a couple examples to show that. So, like I said, is that the Regulus was the royal star. Now it went into Virgo, and I have the exact date, January uh, 2011, it went into Virgo. So it is now, uh, it, it, moved, it, it is in uh, Virgo, and that makes a difference because when it was in Leo, it foretold the, the leaders and kings and royalty. Now I believe that it's actually showing that the Virgo being a mutable earth sign, we're going, it's starting to designate leaders within the medical fields, the spiritual fields, and Virgo on their side also, and it's a rule by Mercury, the communications and social media uh, um, areas. And of course, Antares is in Sagittarius now at nine degrees, 56 minutes from Alta Halts and Pisces. When it was in Aquarius, it was more a mental influence uh, for designating, I believe, inventors and, and uh, we'll say masters of new systems. Now it's in the water sign. It's the, I think we're gonna have more people are gonna be designated that are involved in the social structures of the, uh, of the society. Now the bear now is also in Gemini rather than Taurus, and it's taking on a little different energy. Now here's the Royal Star meetings. As I mentioned, the uh, longitude of Aldebaran at nine, nine degrees Gemini, 57 minutes, and it's in the constellation Canis Major, the, the major constellation of the dog. So it's, it's the eye of the bowl. Now renew of life is what it means and it's the nature of Mars. So it's a very powerful energizer. If you have something within a degree or degree and a half of uh, Aldebaran, it's gonna give a lot of energy and a great capacity performing intense work. And then Gemini, it energizes the mind and can produce also great cunning. And it depends on the course, which planet or position the conjunction, it can lead to honors. But, a, but now being in Gemini, it's hard work of the mind. So if you, the, instead of being, um, we'll say hard work of the earthy nature, now it's, it's taking on the martial energies of, a, of the air element. Regulus, which is now in Virgo, the earth sign, the mutable Virgo uh, earth sign, it went into January 5th, 2011 at 7.27 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. A lot of astrologers will calculate charts of when we'll say significant planets or stars or energies uh, shift from one sign to the other. And they create a chart of that. I've never done it for a fixed star, but that would be one that would be interesting. Now the star of the leader or the ruler, and it's the heart of the lion. Now Ptolemy's, when he, as I said, he would use the natures of the planets to dis describe how it affects you in the chart. So he found it a very expanding Jupiter and a very energizing Mars combined together. And that's why you would produce leaders or presidents. And two presidents that had regular significant in their chart were, uh, were uh, President Clinton and uh, President Trump. And they both had this marked of, in, their, in their charts. Um, now it's, 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 it's in Virgo and it produces leaders, of, I believe medicines of service and also I believe social media leaders. It's a test of the heart. So now the test of the heart will be tested in the areas of the, uh, of the Virgos of more in the medicine, healing and service. Um, Antares is now in nine degrees Sagittarius, 56 minutes. It's the Alpha star of Scorpio. Now it's in the constellation Scorpio, but due to the procession of the equinox, when it was in Scorpio, you know, several thousand years ago, it was in Scorpio for a long time in about, as I said, it, it's uh, nine, it moves eight, a degree every 72 years. So it, about 600 and something years ago, 
it moved out of it, the procession brought it from being in the uh, sign of Scorpio into the sign of Sagittarius. It's a big constellation, Scorpio. It's a binary star. Most stars are binary. Sirius is a binary star also. And according to Ptolemy, it had the nature of Mars and Jupiter. And it's from a water, water emotional sense. And when it was in Scorpio, like I said, Antares could bring about anger or military actions, but it also denoted great courage and devotion, conviction and honesty because uh, Mars can bring the great convictions and Jupiter is the, is the planet of justice. So it can be a uh, great passion, great righteous indignation. In mundane matters, it, it expect, expected integrity. When, and when it would bring wars, that if something with that was a treaty and the integrity of that was broken, it could lead to war. So that's when, when you would look in the placements and when say the sun was going over that point, especially when it was in Scorpio, it would be a time the astrologers would tell their leaders to proceed with caution. And you don't want to violate a treaty during this time. And, uh, and those are kinds of vices because the astrologers in the ancient times were their biggest, their most important function was to uh, give counsel and guidance to those, the, uh, the kings and emperors and those that were in charge of the, uh, of the domain or kingdom. So now it's in Sagittarius. So this will feed the truth in principles. Fire feeds the truth in principles. So we still have this Mars and Jupiter energy and it still has a water component because it's part of the Scorpio constellation, but now it's being fed by fire and the fire of truth and principles are very important. But Mulhalt is at four degrees Pisces that if you take four times 72, so it's about 200 years ago, 200 to 300 years, it shifted into Pisces. So uh, Ptolemy thought it was the nature of Venus and Mercury. And Venus is a planet of what we value, and it's 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 of uh, it's harmony. And then Mercury is the intellectual planet, the mind of the intellect. So this could bring great fortune, but you had to balance your need, your mind and desire. Venus can desire what you value can actually ride to desire. And uh, in the Theosophy, they talk of will and desire. So this is a powerful star, and it's in water now. So the mental and material world have to be in balance. When it was in Aquarius, the mind prevailed, and we saw so many great inventions and inventors. They probably, I, I, they, they had this from Alta Halt may have hit some of these points in Aquarius, producing that also. Now it's in Pisces, so the values of the heart and emotion need to be balanced, and they need to be uh, in harmony to have for success. So it's sort of like materialism versus ideals. So this is an interesting star, but it is a beneficial star because of the nature of Venus and Mercury. And they're in water now, which stirs a little more uh, emotions than it did in, uh, where in Aquarius, it, I believe it stirred more of the mental energies. Now here's the top 20 brightest uh, fixed stars. And I'll be going through this list and I'll be talking about uh, several, I, my top 10 list plus the four royal stars. So actually I have a, and I have one other star. So I have a top 15 list, which I will talk about. But Sirius, as you can see here, at the very top is the minus 1.43. And its nature is Jupiter Mars. So it's a very powerful nature. And it's in the water sign Cancer. So it's coming through cardinal water at the moment. And it's, uh, and it's the, the brightest star that we see in the sky. And... Um, so it's very significant. I find this very significant. And I have a chart, which in fact is my chart. Sirius sits on Uranus almost exactly. And Uranus is the, the uh, planet of astrologers and, and, and also inventors. And I was both those. Now, cannabis is another very strong star at 15 degrees cancer. It's a Saturn-Jupiter nature. So it takes on um, a balance between if you expand too fast, you're going to you're going to get in trouble because Saturn's going to demand that you have discipline and organization. So it's a, it, it's a very bright star at point minus point seven. As you go down here, Rigel Arcturus is uh, right now in Libra. That's a 22, 24. Uh, it's a Jupiter Mars energy. And as you go down this list, you'll see in Vega and you may if you have your chart, you can actually take this list. And like I say, this uh, we will be posting on YouTube. And so you'll be able to go back and refer to the YouTube presentation. 
and find this list and, um, and see if these fixed stars and the nature of these fixed stars affect a certain planet. And of course, there's Altair. I'll be talking about Altair, Aldebaran. We, we have already talked about that. That's a strongly Mars energy. Antares, Mars, Jupiter, that's a number one first magnitude star. So all these stars in, my, in these top 20s are all uh, first order magnitude stars. Regulus is 1.3. It's not as bright as some of the other ones, but it's a very powerful star. And it's, uh, as I said, is one of the royal stars. So we'll be talking about several of these from the uh, list. So as I said, Sirius, which is the, um, we'll say is the, um, brightest star of the zodiac and it's at 14 and a half to uh, 14 degrees 15 minutes cancer jupiter and mars ptolemy gave that there's other planets that other um astrologers and greeks have given them but i still like as i said i still like ptolemy's and uh, so i follow that and a more modern sense i haven't found a list that i've really gravitated taking into newer rulerships like neptune uranus and pluto the newer planets that were discovered after Saturn. But it's a binary star, it's the dog star. And as I mentioned, the dog days of summer came from this. It's related to Egyptian myths, including Osiris and Thoth. Cyrus will give honors, renown, wealth, and ardor. Uh, so that's the ardor because the Mars energy and through uh, ardor and energy, you will gain recognition. So you have to put the work in. It'll, if you put the work in, and the energy properly channeled, you, Jupiter will expand it and bring recognition in your fields. It also stirs the passion of water. It's in cardinal water, uh, cancer, and also loyalty in the highest degree, also referred to as the keeper of the flame. So this is one of the, I think, one of the most important stars. Rigel, it's at 17 degrees Gemini. It's the nature of Jupiter and Saturn. Another one, also Mercury. And I, I included that because I the Gemini energy is very, a mental, and the, it's an air sign, and the and many of the great thinkers were of the sign. Gemini have had strong influence in the uh, Gemini sign. So I, well, I forget which uh, philosopher or astrologer put Mercury in there, but I do look at it there. And so the constellation Orion, and it can bring expansion through mental endeavors, but worries can also present themselves. Scientific and scholarly, uh, they can have romantic disappointments, sort of like. Uh, if you over intellectualize love, you may have disappointments. So, but uh, not that you don't want to have a marriage of the mind. Now, the next very important star is Spica that I like to use. It's in uh, Libra. It's in the constellation. Now, it's in the constellation Virgo, but due to the procession, it's moved into the sector of the sky uh, in Libra. It's been there for quite a while. Um, it's uh, been there. Uh, over a thousand years. So it's a nature of Venus and Mars. So it's a balance between the martial energies and the harmony and balance of Venus and uh, beauty and the arts and appreciation. So it's a very large star. So much larger than Arcturus, which is also there. At, oh, and I'll, that's the next star on the list. But it's, Spica is a good mark for scientists, writers, artists, musicians, and thinkers through hard work, but it requires hard work because you have uh, Mars there and mental cultivation brings success and recognition and literary talent also may be, may be present. So uh, very, very uh, many, most astrologers that talk about fixed stars usually have both, almost all these 10 that I'm going to be listing here along with the four royals, royal stars. Arcturus, it's at 22 degrees, 24 minutes. Uh, uh, Libra, it's the nature of Jupiter, Mars. So you have the expansion again of Jupiter and the energy of Mars. It's coming through the air sign Libra, which demands balance, balance of mind. It's the bear watcher was the name of this star. It has under, undertones of Mercury and Venus also. And again, again, I include that because we're, it is in an air sign. So gains through mental and intellectual pursuit, but culminates through hard work and the development of organized processes. Vega, is at 15 degrees Capricorn, 29 minutes. It's the constellation Lyra, very beautiful. It's the Lyra Musico. So you have the music of uh, Venus and Mercury, the mind of Mercury, it's in an earth sign. So it brings this uh, beautiful creative energy of the mind, uh, especially through music. And it gives benefits, I, ideality, 
hopefulness, refinement, but it can also make the native serious and sober. Uh, the, the Capricorn energy mixes with the Venus and Mercury. It's musical. This star has been noted to be marked in some, uh, some very extraordinary musicians. Capella is a uh, star in Gemini, 22 degrees. It's uh, Riga. It's the nature of Mars and Mercury. So it's a very active mind, but it gives honor and wealth. We'll have a chart that where I show Capella, and I believe it was actually Donald Trump had Capella uh, right on his son. He all, and uh, I should, I'll, I'll just say, I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing this from memory, but he was also went to a military high school and he was top in his class. He was top cadet. That's the valedictorian of his high school class. He was, and that was fond of knowledge and it brought public position and honor, honors. And that's where I think was the star that marked uh, the destiny of, uh, of President Trump and uh, Donald Trump. And of course, it was both, uh, he started off in the military, then he went on business, became extremely wealthy and renowned. So we'll see that in this chart. Polaris uh, is at 28 degrees, Gemini, and uh, 44 minutes, another Ursa minor. The nature of Saturn and Venus. So this is kind of an interesting, you're gonna, it, it, Saturn pulls back, it requires discipline, it requires the lessons to be learned in order to reap the benefits of be, uh, Venus. It's the pole star. And this is why I always, we always look to the pole star. And of course, here again in metaphysical teachings, what you give your attention to is what you manifest. And of course, this is a very important star in navigation and knowing our position on the earth. Now, the binary star of Betelgeuse is also close by at Gemini 2855. It has a different latitude, but it's, they're very close in longitude. And uh, so together, they give an interesting mix of fortune and adversity, the Mars-Mercury of uh, the Polaris. So it, Betelgeuse is Mars-Mercury, and uh, Polaris is Saturn-Venus. So they together give an interesting, so I believe there is, the key here is to keep one sight on their true course, just like the North Star. If the person that has this spotlight, this energy coming from these fixed stars, uh, Polaris and Betelgeuse, keep their eye on the sight of what their true course is, success would follow, could follow. But if one strays off course, storms could be ahead. And uh, so you need to develop the intellect. The key again is the Gemini energy developing the intellect. Algo is at 26 degrees Taurus, 20 minutes. It's in Perseus. Of course, we all love the, uh, the mythology around Perseus. It's the nature of Saturn and Mars. It's the tasks and demands of Saturn on the adventure and quest and the courage and energy of Mars. So it's a difficult star. It requires great discipline and resilience to overcome. And you have to face one's adversity to overcome uh, the, the, with, with discipline, the Saturian discipline. Many times the mythology then in the, uh, the constellation reflects in the alpha stars of these uh, of the constellations. So just like Perseus, I'll go, you'll, you'll have to, you'll be, we'll, you will be going after various quests and you'll have to use your, uh, the, your diligence and your strength uh, to reach. Uh, and, and if you do, you can uh, come out with great results. Markab is 23 degrees, uh, 39 minutes Pisces. It's uh, in Pegasus, another wonderful constellation, the, uh, the winged horse, and it's the nature of Mars and Mercury. Mercury is flight, you know, the Mercury with the winged uh, feet, and Mars is the energy and uh, gallop of a horse. So it gives honors and fortune through hard work and the development of knowledge and understanding. Now it's in Pisces, so there, there's a need to keep the emotions from affecting one's judgment. And that will be a key to find success. So you have this Mars and Mercury combination, which activates the mind, activates hard work. But if, it, but if emotions are mixed in in a very strong degree, the things that you would find success in may be diverted. And the last one on this uh, Alpharaz, it's in 14 degrees Aries, 28 minutes. Uh, it's in the constellation of the Andronima. It is the nature of Jupiter and Venus. We all like Andronima. There's a lot of sci-fi, science fiction books and movies on a, based around Andronima. So it's the nature of Jupiter and Venus. And I, I, I like because of the two benefits, 
Jupiter the greater benefit and Venus the lesser benefit combined here. It's a double star and it gives freedom, independence, love, riches, and a keen intellect. So another fixed star that's very close to uh, my wife Wendy and ours heart is Altair because the name of our street is Altair Path, Path to the Star Altair. So we, we thought this is not, was on the list of 20 stars. It's one of the top 20 brightest. And so we wanted to just show how uh, uh, beautiful winged uh, bird. And it's a very important star also. And uh, I thought it was kind of fitting for astrologers to be living on Altair Path. So it's associated with boldness of action and it's connected to human relationships. And it can, carries a divine fire of inspiration. And uh, it's a risk-taking star and requires dog determination. So it's a star of action and strength. And, uh, and it's a quest for action, not just for its own sake, but to serve others. And right now, the fixed star Altair is at one degree Aquarius, 55 minutes. So it's only been in this, con in this position uh, in, a, in Aquarius and moved from Capricorn into Aquarius about 150 years ago, I would say. It might be 77, about 100, 100, 110 years ago. The name stands for ego in Latin, and it represents the bird carrying the bolts of, a, uh, of the uh, Greek mythology. And so uh, it's a very beautiful star. Okay, so here's the formula. This is what I like to do as you, how can we use these uh, to help us understand ourselves and our chart and doing readings using the natal charts? So in formulating this list and trying to put it together, these are the key uh, factors and variables in the equation of understanding the fixed star. So a fixed star can bring a planet in a chart into prominence and produce great actions. Also when it's at the ascendant, whereas this is actually the ascendant is the place of the sun on the horizon at the time of your birth. The midheaven is, uh, is what is above you and it designates, we'll say your vocational or destiny of recognition and so these are important uh, points. And also I like to look at the nodes. They can bring sudden and unexpected uh, occurrences in your life and, uh, and also energizes those points. They are classified, as we said, by the level of brightness. And they, uh, of course, the first order magnitudes are the most important. And they go from minus 1.43 to six, as we have shown. And Sirius is the brightest at minus 1.43. The star gains in significance the closer it is to the ecliptic, and that's where the, the, the path that uh, the Earth revolves around the sun. And star is a spotlight on the astrological degree in the horoscope chart being analyzed, as, as I mentioned. It's like a laser beam focusing on that point. And understanding the influences and meaning of fixed stars is to combine these following influences. So we want to, everything's a combination, a synthesis of information. So we first look at the fixed star constellation, its history and meaning and mythology, like uh, Perseus and Pegasus. These stars are in those. And then you look to the astrological sign that its fixed star is in, presently in. Because I think it does have a subtle change of energy because each astrological uh, sign is like a lens to which the energy is, is, uh, is going through. And in fixed stars, it may be, we're only seeing the photons. And of course, the gravity is... They say gravity waves can almost instantaneously travel across the light years. So we're still feeling the effects, not only the photons, which take speed, travel the speed of light. They speculate that gravitational waves may uh, travel faster and across great expanses of the, um, of the uh, galaxies. We've been still trying to measure gravity waves. There's a lot of programs. They think they may have, I'm not sure yet. There's also the magnitude and longitude of the star. The magnitude is its brightness and the longitude is the position of the uh, star in the zodiac. Uh, the planetary influences as Ptolemy and others have attributed, that's the like the Mars, Venus, uh, Jupiter, Venus, and those uh, types of uh, combinations because that gives you insights of how these energies are gonna blend in the sign that they are and also the way they are associated with the planet that's being uh, conjunct or affected by the fixed star. And then of course, planets, ascendants, and luminaries that are conjunct by fixed stars. And you can also look to the house being affected because that when you know your time and you cast your chart correctly, then you know the area in life 
be it a natal chart or a mundane chart or a horary chart, which is when you ask a question, it's a predictive art, then uh, then you know that that is being amplified. Now the aspect used for fixed stars is primarily conjunction with planets or cardinal points, like the ascended in midheaven. And, and of course the fixed star points are sensitive to transiting planets, especially if they are illuminating a planet or a point in your chart. So if you, when you have a transiting over that planet, it even becomes more significant because also it's activating the fixed star that has also that had energy at that on that planet. Now the orb is usually one degree. Some use two degrees for Sirius because that's the brightest star and of the in the uh, the heavens, at least from the Earth. And the uh, orb of one degree, 15 minutes can be used for the first magnitude stars, including the four royal stars. I take it up a little further, one degree, 30 minutes, depending on if it's the sun in the moon, the luminaries, which uh, I think it gives, which are very powerful in their own right. And the four royal stars, Aldebaran, and Regulus, Antares, and Fomaltahol. Some astrologers give wider orbs, as I just said, to the conjunction of the sun and moon. So let's look to charts now that we kind of have this formula and we, and we so we formulated these, uh, the, these uh, top, we'll say 20 stars. So let's look at the first chart. And everybody's always, uh, everybody's interested in the, 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 uh, the British royal family. And a very good chart to look at is uh, Prince William. Now, the first thing you look at is the four royal stars because that usually, that usually designates uh, come ascending to the throne or being of great predom predominance. But there, there is one of the four royal stars that connects with his Mercury. And it's uh, within a half a degree. And of course, we give almost one and a half degrees for the fixed, for the royal stars. So Aldebaran, and as we remembered, Aldebaran was the nature of Mars. So it was energizing uh, we'll say he, this, his mind for intense work. Now, and it also gives him a great understanding of a, we'll say of what it's needed to be a royal. So this was a position said right away, he would be very energized and work very hard. Now school didn't always come easy for William. And it actually it was Kate who did um, encourage him to finish his degree, which he did do. And, and he has sort of like a mental disposition for royalty. He's become the stabilizing mind of the royal family. And this is because Aldebaran is very strongly connected with his Mercury and Gemini. So his mind will continue to grow. And of course, in, but, and, and of course he's the you know, most royal serve in the military, but there was a couple other things that were very important. Like I say, he didn't have a very strong connection with, uh, with Leo, he, Leo was out of sign sextiles with Sun and Jupiter, and it was also at the midpoints. But I think the most important uh, uh, aspects that's going to make, that's going to assist Prince William when he does ascend to the throne, I believe he will, is that Sirius, the brightest star in, in the uh, Earth, let's say the heavens that we see from the Earth, is connected to his North Node. And I said the North Nodes deal with the lunar where the moon crosses the path of the earth. And they deal with basically our karmic destinies. The North Node shows what we were going to be doing in this lifetime. The South Node shows what we have brought in from a past lifetime. It also shows that he is gonna be a very hard worker, South Node, but in his North Node is in Cancer. So we have Sirius, which was you know, very closely connected within 20, 20 to 20, 30 minutes. And Sirius is, um, again, the, is a binary star and it's related uh, to um, Jupiter and Mars. So at this point, it shows that Jupiter again, it's a, it was going to expand his destiny. So I think Sirius is what, and it's also deeply involved in the myths of Osiris and Thoth. So I really think that Sirius will stir his passion and his devotion and loyalty to the highest degree. And in the mother sign, Cancer, his devotion to his family, the royal family, has been really epitomized and basically brought to the forefront by Sirius. And loyalty has been very important. He's been very loyal uh, to his the, uh, the queen. He's very 
uh, uh, loyal to the royal family. And he's, I think he's probably the closest son to his father too. And he was the eldest, but he was very loyal and devoted to his mother also. He had Elgo conjunct his Venus and Elgo, and here again, this is why I, I like my list, is uh, another very strong, powerful star. It's Saturn and Mars, and it's at 26 degrees Taurus. So we go to 26 degrees Taurus right over here, and it's, and it's uh, very close within a half a degree of his Venus. So this is, a, this is the Perseus. It's the constellation Perseus, and in its nature, Saturn and Mars. So he's had to work very hard. And he's also had disappointments. And it's in the fifth house of children. And, uh, but I, I think it's also the difficulties with, within their family, but through hard work and success, because this is the fifth house. He's now, he's had how many, two or three children now? Two children, I think it's three. three, three children. So also with the Venus there, he is producing heirs. This is the fifth house is the house of children and enterprise. So he not only has Aldebaran on his Mercury, he, he has uh, Algo on his Venus, which is a very powerful star. So this is what I was saying, these top 20 lists are 25 planets uh, of 25 fixed stars. You can see how they bring prominence and it's right on his Taurus. Through, and Taurus is a hardworking sign and Venus is in the ruling. So it's, an ex it's a planet of high significance. It's a rulership. And, then, and it's right at the position of Algo. So I think that's one of the most powerful positions, which shows again, he will have good fortune and a good fortune through his children and will rise and continue the royal line. Now, Pluto is also uh, conjuncts the Spica. And Spica is at, um, let's see where it's, it's, where's his Pluto? It's right up here at 24 degrees um, Libra. And Spica, is, as I mentioned, it's in the Libra sign, which is harmony. And Pluto represents the, the masses and uh, large groups of you know, people and the mass consciousness. And this was a planet of Venus and Mars, as I, and it's a good mark for artists, musicians, and thinkers. But through hard work and mental cultivation will bring success. So I think this was another very important thing that he will work very hard for the, his subjects. And um, I don't know how long his father will be king, but they, his, you know, his uh, father will be, you know, in his 70s or maybe 80s before he ascends to the, the throne. So, but, but William will be king, I think, for a very long time and will work very hard for the, uh, the royal family because of his serious here on his north node. I'll go on his Pluto and uh, Spica, I mean, Spica on his Pluto and Ogo on his Venus. So you can see how the fixed stars, and I mean, the probabilities of this happened. So he has three very prominent fixed stars, including a royal star uh, on his planet. So that's why I believe strongly that he will ascend and he will hold the royal family together along with Kate, who is an extraordinary woman. Now here's the planet of uh, former president Donald Trump. And again, he start and, and like I say, he's a Gemini and a very powerful 10th house son. Um, I, I didn't, let me just go back one second. And of course, uh, the other augur is the sun and moon conjunct in the seventh house. The seventh house is a powerful house where it's uh, the house of relationships, partnerships, and also the people in a royal, in a ruler's chart. So this is the other very strong indication that William will, will ascend to the throne along with the fixed stars, giving prominence to those uh, positions. Now, Donald Trump had a very strong chart with the sun in the 10th house in Uranus and the sun conjunct his, uh, his north node. When a luminary is conjunct uh, a north node, it usually brings prominence into the life of that individual. And he also had Mars on his ascendant. But the, uh, but the real important part, start, just starting with the uh, royal stars, which usually I, I find in very prominent people, you will find a royal star in a, in a, a sensitive, sensitive point or critical point in the chart. Here, Regulus is sitting right on his ascendant. And the ascendant is the energy that you project out to the world. And Mars is there fueling it too. So that, um, 
Mars on the ascendant. Teddy Roosevelt had a Mars and, and Capricorn on his ascendant. And he was quite an athlete and strong, vigorous person. And uh, as I mentioned that uh, President Trump had gone to military school and he was actually such a good baseball player. He was being recruited by the uh, major leagues uh, at the University of Pennsylvania was his undergraduate school. So this showed that he could have maybe even went into the major leagues, but he became a, a we'll say an all-star within the business world There was here. But back to the Regulus being there, it shows that he had a destiny. The two destiny indicators were the sun in North Node conjunct in the 10th house of uh, power and position and recognition and Regulus, the royal star, the maker of kings and queens and rulers, right there on his ascendant. Now, and, and so that you know, that was the sign of the king, the, uh, the king heart, and Trump was uh, right there when he was born. Regulus is also conjunct the midpoint between the Saturn and Neptune. If you wanted midpoints, I find, especially in, especially in the cosmobiology, which is a German school of astrology, and I've gained great respect for midpoints. Um, they were also very strongly placed and the midpoints are still within a degree of the midpoints. But the other very significant thing, along with his son up here at 22 degrees uh, Gemini in conjunct the North Node, was the very powerful star Capella conjunct his son. So this is this is this showed a spotlight that he was always interested in being, you know, in in, in the uh, in, in a prominent position, whatever he cho chose. If it was the the uh, in industry and wealth and and uh, commercial endeavors, this is the second house of building. Then also his moon was in the fourth house, so he was a real estate uh, innovator and tycoon. So this uh, so it gave prominence uh, to he had he had several careers: real estate and and commerce and economics, building fourth house building, and also they were sending to the presidency. And it was all fed by regulars. And Kapala being right there with the North Node and the uh, Moon in Kapala, it was right, it's 22 degrees Gemini, so it was within a degree. It's the nature of Mars and Mercury, and it gave honors and wealth, renown, eminent public position, and military honors. And as I mentioned, he was a commander in chief, and he also went to a military high school, and he had achieved top honors at the military high school. So this is just an example showing how fixed stars can really show what you're going to be, what's going to be happening in life, at life at you know certain degrees. It varies. Of course, when there's a royal star involved, it really brings prominence and amplifies it. Now here's uh, former President Bill Clinton. He was born, it was a loose conjunction, but when the sun's involved, it's a very powerful uh, sphere. Regulus was there. He was born to be a ruler. It's in his 11th house. He forged a lot of uh, friendships and uh, networks. And uh, Regulus, it was, it, it's not the tightest conjunction, but I think there was two, something else that really showed that Bill Clinton was going to have uh, great prominence. And if you look at the other, uh, other uh, royal stars, they weren't, really weren't connecting with any other planets or positions. So Regulus was the one that got within the orb of the sun in the 11th house. But what's very important, you remember I was talking in Libra, Spica and Arcturus, they were in conjunct Jupiter. And Jupiter is the, you know, the king of the planets. It's the, uh, the greater benefit. And as Jupiter was at 23 degrees. So Jupiter was right at the midpoint within a degree of each of these big stars. And it was just expanding and illuminating the power of Spica and Arcturus. And as I mentioned, they're both, th this is at, this star, Arcturus is at uh, 22 degrees Libra, and um, Spica is at about 24 degrees. And together they brought a, and, and also, like I say, uh, it's a nature of Venus and Mars, Spica, so it was right here on this conjuncting it. So it brought, uh, he was a you know, good mark for scientists, writers, artists, and thinkers. And through hard work and mental cultivation, brings success and recognition and literary talent. Uh, President Clinton has written books. He uh, was a Rhodes Scholar. And Spica, you know, basically um, gave great energy 
to the mental properties of Libra. And he was always forging the Libra relationships. And it's an air sign. It's a sign of uh, connecting with people. Also, as I said, Arturus, which is uh, gained through mental and intellectual pursuit, but culminates through hard work. He, he had, you know, he did, he had a very poor, he was not a wealthy uh, family and he worked up very, he worked right from the uh, uh, very poor and, uh, you know, not a wealthy family in Arkansas. So it showed that through hard work, Arcturus was there with his Jupiter Libra and cultivation development of his mind, he would reach the highest honors that Regulus loosely conjunct to his son brought. But this was the big thing in Jupiter. And again, Jupiter is also uh, thought of as one of the regal, regal planets and brought great honors and position uh, to, uh, uh, but like I said, there's a key. He was quite a charmer and charismatic. I've seen him in person. You could just feel the charisma uh, coming off him. And of course, they, Jupiter could also expand it. And I think he became, uh, his interests in, in certain areas got the best of him. Jupiter can also take you to extremes. So, but this was a very significant that a royal star was involved and also two very important uh, fixed stars were also conjunct Jupiter, which expanded and really amplified his, uh, his life. Okay, the last example is my chart. And we learn best from our own charts because hopefully through astrology, we, you know, know thyself. And that's, uh, <laughs> it's on the Greek schools. Was it, was it Plato, know thyself or Pythagoras? It was one of the two. Actually, I think it was entering the temple of Pythagoras, the school of math, and it said, man, know thyself. So here again, uh, this is my chart. I look at the uh, four royal stars. And you see, they're not really connecting anything. So I'm not a president. I'm not a tycoon. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a hardworking astrologer, engineer, and inventor. But still, <clears throat> I, I feel very fortunate to the fields that I did pursue. Uh, but you, you can see how the royal stars really do bring it a, a next step up. And so, but I didn't have any significant, but one of the, but I did have three fixed stars that really did, I bring, bring my life's path into focus. And from a very early age, I had Sirius right on my Uranus in the ninth house, which is my most elevated planet. And I was always, and I started at a very early age to be, to be an astrologer. And, and as I said, Sirius can give, uh, you know, recognition. And here I am giving a talk. It's a passion. And it was in the water sign of uh, cancer and it gives devotion and loyalty. I, you know, and I like to think that I'm, I'm a, a devoted to uh, those I love and those that I, and the, and the subjects that I pursue. So Sirius was very important in my chart. And uh, I knew Uranus was very, was also when his fixed stars involved with the luminary and my son is squared and aspected to uh, Uranus. It also, I think the, when the sun especially is giving energy to a planet that's involved with a fixed star, it gives a predominance. So Uranus became the most important planet in my, my chart. The, uh, the pursuit of astrology, the metaphysics, um, the arcane knowledge, and also uh, engineering, invention, and science. Now, the other thing is, is that became, I had Arcturus and Spica uh, conjunct my Neptune and Saturn. And it's, it's brought a lot of interesting things into my life. But again, Libra is a sign, but Neptune is like a, a mystical planet. I grew up with uh, mystical parents. My father was an artist, my mother in astrology and a mystic. Uh, Saturn is, uh, of course, a planet of lessons learned and delays. And, uh, and of course, fixed stars enhance it. There's been a lot of you know, both. It's always a mixed bag in one's life, disappointments, delays. And the fixed stars sometimes can exemplify that. And of course, the sun's involved in that because it's an opposition and parallel. So it, achieving what I, you know, in my chart has required hard work, a lot, lot of work at universities, lots of work in my 31-year uh, career in the government and being a government engineer and inventor. And it, was, it became very prominent because uh, the Libra, is a sign of working within organizations and harmony. So I worked in the government. I've also joined a lot of organizations in my, uh, in my lifetime, such as the Rosicrucians, Theosophists, very, on very metaphysical lines. So again, 
this showed that the predominant points in my uh, chart were Uranus is the, the main one. And then the, uh, the Sun, Neptune, Saturn conjunction, which led me into the mystical fields of Neptune and the hard scientific, uh, you know, scientific work of being an engineer and scientist and inventor. So it really shows these became the predominant positions in my chart, the point on my ascendant and the, uh, the Uranus in my chart, which deal in the house of education and education was the key going to university and getting several degrees and, uh, and then working very hard uh, to achieve and, and also the involvement uh, in the, uh, the, mystical, the mystical sciences and arts. And it says in that, and so it shows that, and also would be more mental pursuits. Arcturus is a mental planet and, and, and so is uh, Spica. So that, that was my example. And I, I thought the key here is that I, I feel that I've had a very successful life, but not to the level of the other three charts where they had prominent positionings of the royal stars. So that's, that's what I wanted to touch upon. Now, there, this is our list, and, and Wendy put this list together, and Wendy put together these, uh, uh, many of these, most of these beautiful charts. And, and, uh, and so I'm going to have this list so that you can look in your chart and you can find these fixed stars and you know, positions. I want to include all the signs, and, but I still think the top 25 are the brightest. But here again, you can find a good book on fixed stars. And like I say, we have a reference list and you can look these up and, and the nature, that's always very important because that gives you in the sign, uh, the sign that it's in and the, uh, the, the constellation and sign right here. And you can figure out how it is casting that spotlight on that point. Now here's the reference list. Uh, this, is a, this is a fixed stars and their interpretations by Elizabeth Everton. These are, she was very prominent and her son became a very, very prominent in the cosmo, uh, cosmogenesis and cosmobiology fields. And she, and George Hoffman, uh, he basically took her work and, and updated it. Now, this was my favorite book by Vivian Robson, uh, Robson, and this is the one my mother used. Now, Essays on Astrology by Robert Hand, and Wendy and I both have met and known Robert Hand. He's one of the foremost astrologers. He has the best book on his transits, but he does touch on uh, fixed stars. In fact, we have this book, and I'm going to have to go back and take a look. I didn't get a chance to look that and we read the, uh, the fixed stars essays and chapters. And then there's some other ones that they, uh, the Brady book is a newer book. Uh, Bernadette Brady wrote, it's a very thick and comprehensive book. Um, and being an Aries, I kind of like the more consolidated version, but a, a good Aquarian mind, Aquarius and uh, Gemini can dig into this thick one. And then the secrets of the ancient stars by Diana Rosenberg. That's another one that a lot of modern astrologers you know, use and look at. And of course you can go on Wikipedia, Sky, uh, Sky Strip and Astro uh, theme uh, to uh, look at the fixed stars. And also, I think you can also get a, you may have a chart made from one of these, on yeah. this chart on this the Astro, Astro theme. theme. If you don't have your chart, you can go on Astro theme or just Google free astrological charts or horoscope charts, and you'll be able to get your chart uh, for free. And sometimes with a nice little write up, along with it. So I always end my talks with a poem and uh, that, that's a, a Uranus also. And, and I call this poem, The Watchers of the Night. And uh, so beams from afar created by distant stars illuminate the night creating inner sight. Destiny unknown is now foretold in greatness not expected leads to chosen elected. Fixed stars from afar forever are watchers of the night. So that ends my presentation and thank you everyone for listening. And I hope this is giving some insights and uh, valuable information to help decipher the, uh, the very complex, complex subject of fixed stars. So thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Well